I'm very honored to introduce Venerable D and Irving or Irv as our guest speakers today. Venerable D. Hong is one of the co-founders of the Engaged Buddhist Alliance and has volunteered in several state prisons in California since 2013. He teaches mindfulness meditation and Buddhist psychology there. He's also an adjunct professor of the University of the West, located in Rosemead, California, near Los Angeles. Um, he has been a Buddhist monk since 2006 in the Vietnamese and Chinese Pure Land traditions. He was also ordained in Burmese Theravada tra tradition of the Mahasi lineage in 2014. And Irving Rilova is a student of Venerable D. Han and a Dharma practitioner. He is a formerly incarcerated individual who was originally sentenced to life without parole and spent more than two decades in prison. In 2004, he began his meditation practice and studying Buddhist teachings. Though he expected to die in prison, he was released after 25 years and continues to study and practice Buddhist teachings with Venerable D, while he currently serves as one of the volunteer staff with the Engaged Buddhist Alliance. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me and Irving. And thank you, uh, Jeff and Miao Xin for inviting me to share my experience so I do have a PowerPoint in which I will share. I will go quickly and then follow by Irving and then we'll take questions. Okay. Um, give me one second. As you guys, uh, like before I say anything, the one thing to keep in mind as you listen, especially those of you who are Buddhist leaders. Um, like how do we make Buddhism available to people who need it? How do we bring mindfulness or the Eightfold Path as a way of living to the folks who actually need them? Otherwise, um, even though Buddhism has been around, has been in the US for more than a hundred years, it's only available to people who can afford it. The poor, the people who are making below the um, minimum wage cannot afford to learn it or cannot, and cannot attend a, a retreat. And so in case if you don't know, Buddhism is recognized by the federal government but it does, but it's not recognized by all the states except Oregon. Oregon, they they did accept Buddhism as a religion, and they did hire Buddhist chaplains in the state prisons. Second, as you listen to my look at my stats and look at the problems that the folks inside the prison faced, think about the social economic policy of. <clears throat> the US federal and state governments. It is this policy that had a, an adverse effect on the poor. And number three, they, a good percentage of immigrants from war-torn countries, such as way back when uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, and uh, Laos, and if you look at South America, uh, El Salvador, Honduras, they suffer intergeneration traumas, okay? Uh, this is just a big picture in case, so as you look at, listen to uh, my talk. Um, just a quick note, CDCR, when I talk, 
when I mention it, it refers to California State Department of Correction and Rehabilitation. And like I said, California does not recognize Buddhism as a religion. It does not hire Buddhist chaplains to serve the incarcerated population. California only recognize, inside the prisons, they only recognize Catholicism, Protestant, Judaism, Islam, and Native American. So if you are a Buddhist or any, if you belong to any other religion, you get no help. That's why uh, for us Buddhists to, to go into the prisons, we have to volunteer, we have to do it for free. So currently, uh, this is a general stat from 2020. We had 2.3 million people being held in 1,833 state prisons. Uh, 110 federal prisons, 1,700 juvenile correctional facilities, and 3,100 local jails. And then on top of that, you have immigration detention, detention center and the Indian country jails. And on average, the cost of incarcerating these people, it's about $80.7 billion. This year is going to be more. Um, and here's another piece of information. So with the 2.3 people being locked up, along with that, there are 800 and something thousand people on parole. And when they're on parole, you have to assign officers to deal with them, to work with them. And then there are also 3.7 people, people on probation. A bit of information on people who were incarcerated, their income. On average, um, they only make $15,000 as, as opposed to someone who was not incarcerated, they make $39,000. Uh, for Blacks, it was $11,000. And on the bottom of the screen, in terms of people who could not afford bail, uh, if you look at it, um, for Blacks, 60%, 64% couldn't afford bail. That's why they stay in the jails. For Hispanics, 37, for white, 58. Now here's a stat on California. This is from March 17. So currently there are 160,000 people being in um incarcerated, but of those 94,000 are in custody, plus 52,000 or so on parole. California has 35 state prisons. Um, one is being scheduled to close this year, DVI up north. Um, now the, the, the 94,000 does not include people being incarcerated or being held in 58 county jails. Then in California, we also have 11 federal prisons plus ICE deten detention center. And right now, some 8,000 some 8, people in county jails waiting to be transferred to state prison. This is due to the pandemic. Um, the budget for this year, $13.9 billion. If you look at 94,095, people being incarcerated, that costs $13.9 billion. On average, um, a person cost $81,203 being incarcerated, which is way more than if you sent your kid to Stanford or Harvard, much more. For a woman uh, being incarcerated who is over 55, she would have cost a hundred, a minimum hundred twenty-five thousand dollars because of the he her health condition. For teenagers, this is a two thousand fifteen figure. It would have cost two hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars to lock up a teenager. And then, so with all the money, right? And look at this: the recidivism rate, meaning people who are coming back to prison. Eighty-three percent would be uh, reincarcerated after nine years, the state prisons. 
within three years, 68% uh, would be arrested. Within six years, 79%. For uh, federal prisoners, 39.8% would be rearrested and 64% would be rearrested. So think about the money that our government spent, the $80 billion, but then the majority of these people after serving what, 10, 15, 20 years, the majority of them return to prison. Um, even the California State Auditor questioned the effectiveness of the rehabilitation program in California. Um, they only spent California with the $13.9 billion, they only spent one to 2% on rehabilitative programs. So that's the incarceration. Now this is on death row. Uh, California right now, it has 705 people on death row. Um, and Texas has 203 and Florida um, 333. Now, and then if you look at the ethnicity, the demographic in California, you have 205, 254 black men on death rolls. And what is the percentage of the black population in California? No more than 6%. But they are almost, what, 40, 45% of the death row population. And then look at Florida, 333, 124 of them uh, Abrax. Texas has 204. Uh, Texas, they still execute uh, people on death row. They have been. Um, and the think about the deaf people on death row, even um, as you look at it, two thirds of the overturned death rows were um, based on false accusation. And the majority of them were Blacks and Latino. Uh, since 2006, California has no execute, uh, does not exec, did not uh, execute any death row inmate. Um, and when Governor um, Newsom, uh, he took office, he signed the uh, executive order and put a stop to it. Um, here's why California has no execution because there are no companies, no uh, pharma, uh, I guess pharmaceutical companies would be willing to provide the, the medication to, to execute the death row inmates. Second, no doctor or nurses would be willing to witness because you have to have someone to be, pre to be present. And because of, you know, the fear of backlash from California, from Californians. So those are the reasons why California since 2006 uh, has no execution. That's why we have so many 705 people on death row. Um, so why, why do we have so many people inside the prisons as opposed to Europe, as opposed to even China or Russia? One of the main reasons is that since 1980, or actually back in the 70s, uh, the US government closed most of the mental institutions. And with, especially more so with the Reagan's uh, administration, they closed all of, all of it, most of it, uh, due to budget cut. And then in 1996, the federal mandatory minimum, meaning that anyone who was accused or arrested of crime, they have to serve a minimum of what, 10, 15, 20 years in prison, that's minimum. On top of that, California, back in 1994, passed the three strikes uh, sentencing law, meaning that if you committed a crime, no matter what it, no matter what it was, three times, you'll be in prison for life. Even let's say if you go to the supermarket and steal a uh, snack bar, if you did it three times, the, the law was so vague that the, you could be put in prison for life. So what they did was in uh, 2012, they revised the, um, the law to make it so that it would only apply to violent crimes. 
but the people from 1994 to 2012, there were thousands and thousands of them and they were due to be released in 2019. So you got these people who were locked up for 25 years or almost and boom, you know, now that they're out, how are they going to adjust to society? Four is the bail bond. You know, if you get arrested, if you don't have money to post bail, you are in prison. And prosecutors, public defenders, public, uh, a public defender would have, I don't know, a lot of cases and most of uh, from what, from my experience, a lot of the guys inside the prison told me that they were told to just take, to put guilty, accept, because the public defenders, um, the lawyers didn't have the fund, the money to hire a private investigator to look into the crimes. So he, he, they just usually advise their clients to say, hey, plead guilty. And then the other one is California has one of the most stringent parole requirements. If you don't obey the parole officer, he could send you back into prisons. So that, and so what we do is um, we, I, we bring mindfulness. At first, actually, when I first started, I thought about just teaching academically because I don't think that I was qualified even now like, to teach mindfulness meditation. <laughs> so, like, but then once we got in, the demand was uh, quite high. People asked like, how to meditate. So that's how um, we end up offering mindfulness meditation. And one thing that I make clear to everyone uh, is that I, I did not make any preference over any Buddhist traditions. Out here, we have Theravada, we have Zen, we have Mahayana, we have Pure Land, Tibetan. But inside the prison, they have enough issues to deal with. They have, they, most of the folks inside the prisons, most of them are seg segregated, meaning they tend to hang out with their ethnicity, just in case if there's a, in case if there's a, a, a riot, a race riot, they attack each other. So for me, I, I just don't want to say, oh, this is Mahayana, this is Theravada. No, I don't do that. I just offer them the basic of the Buddha's teaching and the meditation. And also one thing that I don't do is convert people or ask them to convert because it's not my job. Uh, because after all, this still is a Christian country. And the topic that we cover, you know, those, the, um, usually in any visit we have from 90 minutes to two hours, sometimes three. Um, so I usually, I, I don't talk that much inside the prison. I usually spend no more than 15, 20 minutes to talk about a subject. And we meditate at least half an hour to 45 minutes to an hour. And then, um, and then I open up the time for Q&A. Um, we were also allowed to hold day-long meditation uh, from typically 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. In one of the prisons, we were able to get in from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, another thing that it was beneficial to our program was that in California, they passed the Prop 57. Me, it means that if a person who came to my visit uh, for 52 hours, uh, he or she would get 10 days of the sentence. So each year with us, you know, the self-help programs, they would be allowed to have 40 days taken off their sentence on top of their college courses. So right now, like if a, per, if, if a person uh, is to take a college course and complete it, he would get at least one week off his sentence. So um, with, I have been visiting from eight prisons now to now five. Um, and there is a good percentage of people inside the prison having some form of mental illness, at least 30%. The other thing that we couldn't really teach um, academic Buddhism is because the, the reading comprehension level of the incarcerated population is at sixth grade. And there was no way to get books 
it was it was it would be next to impossible to bring books in anyway. So, um, and since the pandemic, I couldn't visit. So on average, I would receive 15 to 20 letters. I would send books and stamps to them. The books that I sent, sent to them are approved by the Board of Parole Hearings. So, so that they can read and write book reports and prepare themselves for their hearing. Some of the testimonials, you know, if you guys want, I can send you this. I, there's no need for me to read. So one thing to keep in mind, so like, why do people commit crimes? Most, from my experience, the people who came to my visit, most of them will suffer some form of abuse at home, physical, mental, uh, emotional, or sexual, or neglect or abandonment. Uh, they were either bullied in school, so then they joined the gang. They suffer, you know, because of the abuse, they turned to drugs. Or some of them having some sort of mental illness or learning disability. And of course, the majority of them were raised by single parents, mostly mom. And what was their sin? Just because they were poor. Uh, you, you guys saw the, the income of the incarcerated population, it was only on average $15,000 a year. Another note on, the on their traumas, um, I, I, I found that I know it's almost next to impossible to get any of the stats on traumas because uh, I guess the states don't usually publish them. Um, so any form of abuse, is traumas. Or if someone came from a war-torn country like myself, Vietnam, we suffer traumas, period. Um, and if you look at the stat from um, the federal government, uh, from the Bureau of Justice, 19% of the prison inmates, uh, they suffer physically or sexually abused before their sentence. For women, the average is at least 40%. Here in a, a sample of 4,000 male prisoners, 56% of them suffer physical traumas. A quarter of them were abandoned. Uh, about 10% or less suffer sexual abuse. And not only that, the, the abuse or the trauma continues after incarcerate, incarceration. Um, this is a stat on a typical, on, on, in a uh, prison in New York, uh, one in three girls suffer some form of abuse by 18. 37% of women in state prison were raped before incarceration. Uh, in uh, at Bedford Hill State Prison, um, ninety percent of women suffer physical or sexual violence. Um, another thing, you guys know the first for for those of you uh, who are Buddhists, you know the first noble truth, right? And this is what I use in my Buddhist psychology class at the at the very foundation that we suffer aging sickness on a regular basis that we don't know or we never pay attention. So on top of that, people who suffer trauma, that, that added another layer of traumas. And then this is a typical person, right? And then when they have relationship, if the relationship doesn't work out, so that's another trauma. And then on, you add it on the daily stress. But for folks inside the prison, they suffer trauma abuse at home once they get into prison, they also suffer more traumas. So they have even more experience, more traumas than we do. Another thing before I end it is the, what, what I call the unintended consequences. This is for the uh, correctional officers. They don't want to be called guards. Just keep that in mind, correctional, the COs. 10% of them, um, committed suicide or attempted to. And their longevity, uh, it's only 58. And this is an, a 2018 study. Uh, 
for for re retired officers, their percentage is like fourteen percent who wanted to commit suicide. So that's it. That I so that's all on on my part. Uh, I hope that gives you enough information <laughs> to have some sort of big pictures on the state of incarceration, mass incarceration in the U.S. and more so in California. With that, I hand it over to Irving. Hey, Irv. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, and uh, it's a privilege to uh, be here with all of you and you know share my experience. Um, from my own personal experience, I'd, I'd you know I'd like to touch on some of the uh, things that Venerable De Hong you know mentioned in his PowerPoint. Um, for me, you know I, I'd call it the consequences of mass incarceration. Um, in 1994, I committed my crime at the age of 18. And on my 19th birthday, I was uh, arrested for uh, murder and I was facing the death penalty. By the time I was 21, I was uh, tried, convicted and sentenced to life without parole. Um, mind you, this is the mid nineties and this is the height of uh, all the violent crimes and not just, you know, not just in, you know, the Los Angeles area, but pretty much throughout the country. And particularly LA County, um, that this was the height of all the violent crimes, drugs, anything involving drugs or gangs. And as Venerable men, uh, uh, mentioned, you know, three strikes. So when I got arrested in 94 and you know, I was fighting my case for two years. Um, I saw all the guys coming in, like he, he said, anything just like petty or whatever, guys were coming in with, you know, with life, you know, they were expecting, you know, life imprisonment. So, you know, this, this was the era of, of, you know, get tough on crime. So that was 94, I uh, fought my case for two years. So in 96, um, after everything I was, tried, convicted, and sentenced, you know, to life without parole. Well, technically, it's called life without the possibility of parole. But for those of us that, you know, live through that or going through that right now, we just call it life without parole because from the last, not, not this last one, but uh, uh, Governor Brown, his last term back then uh, in the late 70s. This is from the late 70s and all the way until I'm going to say 2000, mid 2016, 17, there wasn't anybody getting out. Anybody that had life without the possibility of parole, there was no one getting out. So in 1996, uh, I was sent to one of the worst uh, prisons in California. Um, I was sent to uh, New Folsom it's in Sacramento. Um, one of the things that they would do Anytime you get sentenced and you get sent to a state prison, they always send you to the opposite end of where you live or where you committed your, uh, uh, where you were residing. In other words, where you committed your crime. So if anybody's from Southern California, once you hit prison, you get sent to, you know, all the way up north. So, ninety six, um, I got to uh, New Folsom, and I remember, you know, being in a bus and you know, driving up to uh, Old Folsom and then New Folsom. And I remember thinking to myself, I said, okay, you know, this is it. You know, um, this is me for the rest of my life. So I accepted that reality that, okay, this is, this is where I'm going to be for the rest of my life and I'm going to die in prison. Um, one of the things was New Folsom was one of the prison that, everybody dreaded to go to and i remember there was a guy in the bus and he was asking around you know hey how much time you're doing and i said you know i'm doing life without and he just had this look he said man you know good luck man you know I, I hope you survive this um and the majority of 90 percent just about 90 percent of all the lifers anybody that has life without or term to life which is 25 15 of life everybody was 
getting sent to a maximum security prison. And this particular prison I was in, uh, uh, New Folsom, since this is a maximum security prison, all what we call rejects, in other words, if you're getting in trouble in other prisons and you get kicked out of there, you were getting sent to New Folsom. Um, guys that are coming from uh, what we call SHU, which is security housing units, which is like a prison within a prison. If we get in trouble and we get written up and we get more time, we get to, you know, shoot. So when you get kicked out of there, New Folsom was one of the shoe kickouts. Um, my first year over there, I was there for a few uh, the first few months. Uh, we had a big riot and we were on lockdown for a whole year. I mean, we, we were stuck in our cells, you know, 24 hours a day. I mean, there was nobody getting out of the cells. Um, so when we have lockdowns, there's no programming. And since everything is shut down, there's no jobs and so nobody's going to, you know, they're, they're assigned uh, prison work. Um, even with little uh, education programs they had, everything was cut off. So that's, that's one of the uh, uh, things that, that we had to deal with in prison, you know, uh, uh, during lockdowns, um, which in turn, just as I mentioned, we get sent to the furthest place from where we live, where we used to live. So that severs a lot of family ties and that severs your friendships. And especially when you're in a maximum security prison, you only get one phone call a month and that's 15 minutes. That's if you even get all that 15 minutes. So as years went on, as, as the population grew, everything got worse. Uh, the food, I mean, there's really no nutritional value in the food, you know, that they, they, they provided for us. So that in turn affected our health, our well-being. So with the population growing, you know, medical was, was bad. I mean, you know, there's, there's, we, we had this, this running joke amongst ourselves. It's like, you know, if you're not, you know, like, Hey, we ask you, how you feeling? And the guys goes, no, I feel sick. Well, why don't you go to medical? I said, no, I'm good. You know, I'm trying to live. I'm not, I'm, I, I do not want to go to medical, you know? Um, on top of that, uh, throughout the years, you know, they even cut off vocational programs, vocational training programs. Um, that's because now with the population, it's like, okay, you know, how, how are we going to, you know, hire, you know, they want to hire, they, they don't want to, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's the, uh, uh, the, uh, prison guards, the, uh, correction officers, their union. So. That, that was one of the, the main things that, that drove, you know, I mean, from my experience, from seeing and being right in the middle of that, you know. So, um, so f for, for the first uh, three years, you know, I was in Folsom, and then I got transferred to, finally got transferred to Southern California, closer to where I live. But by then, um, you know, my, my family ties had been severed. You know, I hardly heard from any, anything from my family. So, you know, my turning point was, you know, just one day I was in a cell and it just, it just hit me. It's like, okay, there has to be more to life, to my life than just doing life without parole. So, you know, I started writing to different organizations and I started, you know, receiving books, you know, like self-help books. And for some reason, all the books I was getting is, is it's all along within the line of Dharma or meditation. So that's how I got started. And, you know, I, I like to say that, you know, people would ask me, well, how did you, you know, come to the Dharma? I always say, well, no, the Dharma found me because, you know, here I am not having any idea and I'm just writing to these places and they're sending me all these Dharma books and, you know, meditation. So early on, 2001, you know, that's when I started my I started, you know, meditation, but it wasn't until like a few years later, right around 2004, that's when I, I you know, decided, okay, I'm going to become a Buddhist and, you know, really, you know, put my life into that path. So that's when I started, you know, my formal studies in uh, the Dharma. Um, I actually, you know, meditated every day, every morning I did that. 
And and I people would always ask, you know, because they hear meditation, it's like they automatically think you're just sitting down on a cushion. I said, no, it's a uh, uh, meditation is is being aware, having awareness of all your thoughts and your actions. So for me, what really helped me with meditation was not just my life in prison, not just my experience, but it also helped me put uh, into perspective my whole life. You know, what got me into prison and the stuff that I was dealing with in prison. Um, you know, with meditation, I, I was able to make sense of, you know, the trauma that, that you know, I saw growing up and I experienced. Um, and just to kind of touch up on what Venerable was saying, you know, with trauma, it's like we don't we don't talk about these stuff in prison, you know, because we we it, it's it's very dangerous for us to be vulnerable amongst each other, because if you share something personal, that could be used against you, you know, in in so many different ways. So you know, for me, you know, it, it took me years before I was able to you know tell people that yeah. You know, I was I was born in the Philippines and I was, you know, born in the midst of a martial law. So growing up, I saw a lot of corruptions and, you know, political violence. Um, and then on top of that, uh, when I was 13, I saw my father died right in front of me. Um, you know, he died in an accident. And then not long after that, like in less than three months, you know, I just uh, came home one day and my mom was raging mad. And, and she just out of nowhere just told me, she said, hey, you know, do you want to know who your real mom is? I'm like, I didn't know what to say. So, you know, with that, going through that and, you know, losing my father and then finding out I was adopted. And then my mom telling me, you know, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. I don't want to take care of you anymore. Go live with your dad's family in America. So, you know, that time it's it's. You know, besides feeling that the only person that cared for me, that really cared for me was my dad, was gone. And then now hearing this from my mom, it's like, okay, you know, I, I felt like a piece of dirt, you know. So from then on, but it, th these are the things that I never talked about. Um, so, you know, with, with the help of, you know, meditation and studying the Dharma, you know, on, in so many ways on my own, I, I processed all this. and you know, with the help of, you know, studying the Dharma and what limited, especially, you know, like I mentioned with it, you know, the population in prison, you know, growing, um, they were very limited, especially for a, a maximum security. It was very limited to, uh, to have self-help classes. So majority of us, you know, we had correspondence courses and there were a lot of, uh, uh, by, by then, by the mid 2000s a lot of the programs were gone you know vocational program educational programs so we took it upon ourselves to initiate you know self-help courses you know we would write to different organizations and you know one of them is is you know for meditation um just as, as venerable mentioned you know uh, buddhism wasn't you know recognized as a religion so from my personal experience and in, in, in our Sangha, it's like we were always threatened. It's like, okay, you guys don't have the numbers. You know, we're gonna take your, your, your chapel time, chapel slot. So, you know, for a time I was, there was, there was a time that I was the only one going to the chapel, just meditating by myself. Just so with the help of, you know, other guys saying, hey man, just, just show up, you know, just show up, stay for an hour, you know, just so they won't take it so they can see somebody's going in there. So that was, that was one of the consequences of, you know, the mass incarceration. Um, you know, throughout the years, you know, I, I, I with, with a lot of struggles and, and challenges, you know, within prison and personal, you know, emotional and, and, and mental uh, uh, pain and trauma, you know, I, I, I struggled with that and, and I stayed with it. Um, now getting into re-entry uh back into you know 
the free world, we, we always call it free world. Uh, as I mentioned, for, for all of us that, you know, doing life, you know, we never expected to get out. So for me, it's like, okay, I accepted that fact. I made my peace You know, I'm going to die in prison. But it wasn't until like around 2016, 2017, you know, there were talks of, you know, Governor Jerry Brown, you know, giving commutations. So for me, it was like, okay, I, I deserve to be in prison. And it's like, I never really thought about it. It wasn't until I was pushed by my wife and my best friend to put in a packet. So not really expecting anything. So I put in a packet and not, not expecting to be interviewed or you know, to be considered. So I, had a, a, I was granted a commutation. So, which is, which is very rare for somebody doing life without parole. And it was uh, 2018 where I was, my sentence was commuted. And, you know, not expecting that at all, it's like with, with, with the mass incarceration. So for those of us that are, for those of us that are very fortunate enough, that, that were lifers, that were commuted, it's like we, we really did, didn't have any preparation. You know, it was, it was kind of like, okay, I'm just gonna continue what I'm doing. But there was a handful of us that got out and a lot of these guys reached out to us and started giving us information on what to do and what are the things to consider. So, you know, with, with this whole mass incarceration and, you know, as I mentioned, you know, family and friends, you know, your ties were severed. So there were there was a there was a lack of uh, support and lack of resources because um it was less than less I'm going to say less than 10 years less than 10 within less than 10 years that nobody really didn't know what to do with any lifers getting out because I know I personally know guys that got out guys have been out 7 6 7 8 years and when they first got out these were former lifers like myself and the parole department, the parole agents, they didn't know what to do with these guys because for decades, no lifers was getting out. So they didn't know what to do with them. So they, they, it, was, it, was, it was very rough on these guys because as, as you know, Venerable mentioned, you know, California has one of the strictest. So back then they would just tell the guys, Whatever your conditions are, you know, don't drink, don't don't do any drugs, or stay within your you know fifty mile radius of where you live. So you're very limited, and that's all they told these guys. There's nothing where okay, do you need counseling? Do you need therapy? Do you need substance abuse, AA or NA? None of that. So fortunately for us, that got out after these guys. Some of these guys, I mean, mind you. These guys are doing 20, 30, some guys even over 40 years. So a lot of us had connections with some of these guys that got out. So we were fortunate enough that, you know, with, with, with the relationships that, that we, you know, we formed in prison and, you know, the bond and the understanding, you know, uh, uh, recognizing and, 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 uh, 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 not forgetting what they've been through and what they're going through now. We were very fortunate that these guys were able to start, it's kind of like what we did in prison. We started our own like self-help programs. So a lot of these guys started doing that out here. So, you know, the, the lack of support and resources, um, you know, one of the, uh, uh, when we go to the parole board to uh, parole hearing, uh, the board will give us a, a conditions. Well, un until like I'm gonna say until last year, but before that, when I got, I've been out for you know almost two years. The board would would say we recommend, but really it's it's you have to go to these programs that they you know they recommend, which is you know transitional housing. Um, it's a minimum of six months and. Mind you, these are 
you know, funded by the prison, by a, a CDCR. So it's like this is just a continuation of, you know, being in prison, but like less custody, so to speak. So as I mentioned, there was, you know, lack of support after, you know, decades in prison for 20, 30, 40 years. So what from my personal experience, one of the well, one of the few things that they, they lack is, you know, the adjustment into, you know, the free world, you know, social adjustment technology, um, financial, financial support, health, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, with, with this pandemic and, uh, uh, a lot of the guys, there was, there was, there was a, quite a number of guys that, that actually made it out of prison, went to transitional housing. And unfortunately they passed away in transitional housing because of COVID. So that is one of the consequences. And for myself, and I can safely speak for a lot of the guys, you know, a lot of the trauma, we, we, like I said, we don't talk about it in prison is because it's, it's very dangerous for us. Um, you know, that, that continues on out here. And fortunately for me, there's, there's a handful of groups, you know, through zoom since the pandemic, you know, we have a, you know, venerable, uh, uh, we have a, a, a weekly meditation group every Sunday. So that helps me and a lot of the guys that, you know, just got out a uh, uh, deal, not just, you know, transitioning back from prison out here, but to have a free space where we can actually, you know, talk about what's going through our mind and, you know, what we're struggling with. Um, because for us, it's like, it's hard for us to identify or relate for somebody that never did time, you know. Um, one of the things that I always like to point out is, just the, the simplest thing is this. When, when somebody asks you, let's say you, you had a, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say, a, well, I'm gonna say a disagreement, you know, you're talking to somebody who had a disagreement. When somebody just asks you, you know, after like somebody overhears you and they ask you after that and say, hey, what do you think about that? Or how do you feel about that? You know, out here you can say, well, you know, the guy pissed me off or, you know, I feel like you know, punching him or kicking him in the butt. In prison, we can't, we can't do that because that's, that's very dangerous because somebody can use that and turn it around and say, hey, this guy just told me this, that he wants to kick your butt. So it's like for us out here, it's, it's, it's hard for us to really open up because because not just the trauma, but there's there's always that that trust issue, and we always think that hey, you know, a lot, a lot of guys would say this, you know, when they first get out, it's like man, I feel like everybody's watching me, you know, like everybody's like suspicious. So for me, um, part of my, I'm gonna say part of my adjustment, part of my healing, um along with my meditation, you know, I still keep in contact with uh, a lot of the guys that I did time with. Um, and on average, I'm, I get about, I'm going to say about six calls a week from prison. And, you know, I, I let these guys know the things I'm doing, but I also let them know the guys that I know that I know are, that are getting out, going to transitional, you know, I'm giving, I'm giving them a heads up what to expect, you know, what to do and what not to do. And even as, as simple as, you know, technology with the phone, you know, and I remember I was fortunate that the transitional housing I was in, I knew most of the guys that was there because they all got out, you know, a few months before I did. So, you know, guys would just, without me even asking, hey man, you know, let me, you know, let me show you how to do this on your phone because, you know, they understand just by looking at us, like, okay, I know what, he's going through. So, you know, for, for me, it's, 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 you know, mass incarceration not only affects us in prison, but it only, it also affects us out here, you know, for those of us that are fortunate enough to make it out. And, you know, hopefully more and more of the laws change because it's, 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 
I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys, you know, heard, you know, all the, uh, uh, with the COVID, you know, how it's, it's raging throughout the prisons. So yeah, it's, 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 you know, that's, that's from my personal experience. Uh, that's, that's what I'm able to share. So thank you everyone for your time. Wow. That was a powerful, powerful testimony. Thank you so much, Irv. And, and um, the stats that you provided, Venerable, are staggering as well. So um, I would like to go ahead and open the floor for uh, Q&A. Nancy, go ahead. Hi. So I'm talking to Irv, right? Irv or Venerable D, whichever. Okay, so this is for Irv. Hi, Irv. It's wonderful to meet you. I'm so happy that things have gone well for you. And um, I, I'll just tell you just a really quick background thing. I started a um, mindfulness studies graduate program at a university here in Cambridge. And I'm developing a course, a new course that is going to have um, uh, discussions of my, about mindfulness in certain really important areas like the environment, mental health, and prisons is one of them. So I want to learn as much as I can. And one thing that I was really interested in is um, uh, Venerable was saying that you learn about Buddhism in um, your, your program. You learn about these really complicated topics like dependent origination and the five skandhas and stuff like that. So did you learn that stuff? And is that meaningful to you? Because sometimes in um, prison, there are mindfulness programs. They just do mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is different. It sounds like you're really getting into these you know, deep Buddhist um, teachings. So I was wondering uh, if that's right and how that was for you studying that stuff. It's kind of complicated. I find it complicated. <laughs> um, you know, for for me, I, I particularly I, I you know practice uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism and the Gelug tradition. Um, I was fortunate enough that we had you know volunteers at the time, and. You know, I was offered uh, 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 this course by FPMT, which is a Liberation Prison Project. Um, you know, I was offered this course, Discovering Buddhism. So, you know, it's basically the fundamentals and all that. Um, for me, what, what helped me in the very beginning was just, you know, I was, like I said, I was fortunate enough, you know, I was able to receive these books, but across the board, and and i've seen it firsthand you know when especially when venerable started coming um for a lot of guys that that were just starting off was just being mindful of their thoughts yeah because especially for for those of us that are incarcerated i mean you know thinking back right now i'm just like i can i can automatically put myself back like i'm in prison again um we have so much stuff going on in our mind I mean, you know, not just our personal stuff, but the stuff that we had to deal with in prison. Yeah. So for us, for myself and for, for us, just to be able to at least, I'm going to say 15, 30 minutes a day where we can just sit and not just sit, but whatever it is that we're doing, we can just pretty much quiet our mind and able to set that aside, you know, all the stuff that we're going through, it was actually very helpful. You know, I mean, it's, 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 you know, a, a lot of guys used to, to look at me and, and my, one of my, well, our term we use is, is cellies, which is cellmates. You know, when we would go on lockdown, my cellmate and I would enjoy it. And guys were like, are you guys crazy? You guys are stuck in a cell. Well, I would tell guys, look, I'm able to, in so many ways, feel safe because I don't have to be out in the yard, you know, deal with whatever is going to go on out there. But I was able to catch up on my reading, catch up on my studies, and really meditate and take my time and not yeah. worry about, okay, well, it's time to go. So from my personal experience, um, I, 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 
like what Venerable was saying, you know, I agree that, that I guess everybody has to start off with just being mindful, you know, just being able to take care of yourself and say, hey, you know, kind of settle and one thing at a time. Because I remember I was, when, when they first, when more and more guys started meditating in prison, I mean, at least the particular yard I was in, I was always often asked by one of the uh, uh, facilitators. He said, hey, we got one guy. He said, one guy here that meditates. He said, can you share to us you know, how that feels? And what I would always describe is like, look, it's like when you wake up in the morning, before you, that, that split second, that moment where you get your first thoughts, it's like, to me, that's what meditation is. It's like you have this, this calm and, 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 and clear and, and serene feeling. Thank you, Nancy, for that question. Yuri, go ahead. Hey, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you, Venerable G and Irv, for the talk. I'm sorry for the English. I'm not a native speaker. Uh, uh, I was thinking, uh, I, I would like to ask you both actually from different perspectives because the Dharma, he always talks like, a, I think a big part of the Dharma is compassion. And in a mass incarceration system, like not, not just the, the incarceration itself, but I mean the, the whole system we live in where this can happen. And when you go to the, 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 the how, how do I say the, uh, incarceration system itself to teach about compassion or you're incarcerated and you learn about compassion and you're like the, the oppressed part of that system and it looks I, I imagine that it may feel like your life is less valuable than all your life because like I have said you have you're pride from a lot of stuff a lot of like basic stuff that you, you're dehumanized or uh, and in a sense, how is it like to, to like to pass the idea of compassion for verbal D, and how is it for Irv, for you Irv, to like to hear about compassion? And I, I mean, is it like how is it like to believe in that that, that that's possible? That's I I can imagine. I just like to hear you too. Thank you. Okay, um, I hope I understand the question. Um, compassion, uh, as you know, is one of the Brahma Viharas, right? And and I did, to be honest with you guys, <laughs> I don't know much about it when I became a monk back in 2006. Uh, I didn't know much, about, I didn't study much about it until I get into the, until I volunteer inside the prisons. And um, one of the two of the books, best books that I use, one is by uh, Sharon Salzberg. Um, she, she wrote a great book on, on uh, loving kindness. And then there's one by Kristen Neff. Uh, she wrote a book on self-compassion. So what, what I do tell people and also what I do for myself is um, compassion is our ability to recognize that we are under a lot of stress. And second, what we are going to do about it, how we can take care of ourselves. In my past life, you know, when I was stressed out, the first thing I would do is go get a drink, <laughs> get, a, get a glass of wine, right? That's how you relaxed. But for, uh, for, um, for, for me now, you know, that's not an option. So, um, and usually I would tell people that you have to have compassion for yourself first before you have compassion for anyone. You, we, we tend to think that we can help, it's good to help people, but we don't know how to help ourselves. We don't know how to be compassionate. We tend to hold ourselves to certain standard and we criticize and judge ourselves harshly. 
and that usually would lead us to nowhere. And for quite a few, it would lead them to some form of substance abuse to find a, uh, an escape or to numb their feelings. And and so and I do. There there were two. Uh, there were few phrases that I used actually that that uh, Kristen F used. Like, you know, may I love myself con unconditionally? But I added that you know, may I not do anything to harm myself, because compassion is to suffer with, is to be with the suffering but not to reject it or suppress it. So I usually would add that phrase inside the prison, like, may I not do anything to harm myself and, other, and others. And that's usually my understanding of compassion. Lubin, do you have anything to add? Um, just, just to touch up on one thing that, that you know, uh, Yuri, mentioned was the humanization. Um, you know, from my own experience, uh, I, I remember, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use this because I remember reading, I don't know where I read this, but you know, the Buddha says that to have compassion for others is to have compassion for yourself. So for, for a very long time, this, this went through my mind, it just ate me up. Um, for me, I'm going to say I really started feeling compassion was for what got me in prison. Um, the person that I killed, he actually raped a friend of mine. So for a very long time, I never saw this, this person, not as a person, but as a, as a rapist. So and I remember, this is another thing that I remember a friend of mine said that, look, once you put a label on somebody, you start to dehumanize them. And that ate through me for, for a very long time. And then reading that, what the Buddha said, and I remember, okay, from my own experience, looking at this person, not as a rapist, but as a person just to set that to the side, you know, I, I identify that with myself as, okay, here's a person that I took away from his family. He lost a family and his family lost a brother, an uncle, a son. So for me, it was the same thing. You know, it's like, I lost my family because, you know, when I was in prison, I, my family cut me loose. I mean, I, I didn't hear from my family that for 15 of the last 25 years I did in prison. So, for me, compassion, that's how I started to apply it to myself, understanding that, okay, before I put a label on somebody, what is it that this person went through? What is it that it, it's not so much, you know, we, we all have this habit where we see something that somebody does and it's like, okay, what's wrong with that person? So for me, I learned to see it as, okay, before I catch myself before saying what's wrong with this person. And I started to think what happened to this person, you know, to start to do to, to humanize that person instead of just looking at that person as, as this label. So for me, compassion, that's where compassion comes in. And little did I know that that in turn helped me heal myself, you know, thinking that, you know, I mean, that, 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 that's one of the, the, the main things. It's hard for us to forgive ourselves. And I'm still working on that. I mean, that's, that's like, I can honestly say that. It's something I'm going to work on for the rest of my life. Because, you know, for me, it weighs heavily, heavily that, you know, I didn't, just take, I didn't just take one person. I just didn't kill one person. You know, I took a piece of everyone's life because this is somebody's not just the person that i killed but i have co-defendants i took them i took them away from their families so this is something that, that that i will constantly have to work on for the rest of my life so 
one of the things that, that I wanted to point out was, I remember somebody pointing this out in one of the classes that I took in prison. And I remember him telling me and a lot of the guys in the class, he's like, have you guys ever stopped and think that what you, what brought you guys to prison, what led you guys to your crime, that was trauma. And then you guys going to prison, doing life for the, for the rest of your life in prison, that's another trauma. It's like there's no break there. There's no break in between. You guys didn't have an opportunity to kind of step back and look at your life, look at your situation, because you guys just constantly have to, you know, survive and deal with what's in front of you. So meditation, for me, meditation, the Dharma, that's where that break comes in because I'm able to sit back and be aware, okay, what is it that, that it's, it's, you know, triggering me or what is it that making me react a certain way? So I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Yuri, for the wonderful question and the great answers. Um, by the way, Yuri is calling in from uh, Brazil. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, Shannon had the hand out first, and then Lumi, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Irv and Venerable and Mika for organizing. Thank you. Uh, I am here uh, from Western Massachusetts, and um, because we were uh, books were brought up, I, I thought I would talk about becoming Miss Burton, and then uh, the new book that um, Ruben Jonathan Miller wrote. And Ruben um, comes to it kind of the same way, uh, prison advocate, formerly incarcerated persons advocacy the way that I do because my brother too was in jail and um, our lives were, were pretty parallel in that I was in his life as much as I was allowed to be considering the system was set up to keep me out. And once he was uh, fortunate enough to, to get out, um, he did, he stayed with me while he was on parole. He wasn't in a federal prison like you were, uh, Irv, but, um, so he didn't have a halfway house to, to get out and go to afterwards. He relied on what family would still talk with him. And, um, so that kind of caused me to shift in my career and work on, um, employment opportunities for people who are currently incarcerated and getting to that population has proven a pretty difficult thing. Um, the, the nonprofit I'm starting has had to kind of go through a bunch of different channels to, to find out sort of what access you all, what you had when you were in there, Irv. And um, it, all I know is, is often, you know, you go in and with, with things that you don't come out getting, you don't, you no longer have your personal identification. All of these things, you basically need to get a paycheck, you know, bank account, like you said, no technology, limited resources to learn about that upon, you know, release. Is there something critical that, that you could identify? Um, and, it, and it could be, you know, dharmic, it could be sangha related, it could be questions to ask yourself about the layers of samsara you've experienced, you know, um, even, you know, self-study. Is there anything that I might be able to include in my, my, um, my toolkit for, for people who are um, using, I can't really talk about what I'm doing because it's too complex, but, but essentially giving people a toolkit so that when they do, when they are released, they, they, they have comfort because of, um, is there you know, anything you might be able to, to say, yes, this concretely would have, would have helped me and, and my friends a lot more if, if it had been there. Um, the only thing, the main thing that I can, I can really say to point out across the board is, I mean, just, just, you know, with everything with, um, in terms of dealing with, you know, social people around you know out here in the free world that technology you know financial and health was 
you know, for, for, you know, for us, for the majority of us that did all those time, 20, 30, close to some guys for over 40 years in prison. One of the things that, that we're kind of hesitant is just to feel safe and have and trust in someone to ask them for help just just for whatever reason you know, it, i mean it could be anything um one of the, one of the things that 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 i would do till this day and i know guys that get out and i you know i get their number and i call them because you know one of the things we're required to have as soon as we get it is a cell phone because one the transitional housing where you're staying they have to know keep in touch with you and the pro agents well one of the things i always tell the guy is that hey there's this app where you can get all the bus schedules the different routes just as simple as that you know because you know it, it's it's we we tend to you know to be hesitant to ask for help you know because we we just like i said we get this feeling i mean i get it to to this day i still get it you know i'm, I'm almost out for two years you know, even just just outside my front door and around the neighborhood, if somebody asks me a question, it's like, okay, how am I how am I able to answer this without telling them? Well, I really don't know what to tell you because I've been locked up for over twenty five years. I mean, for twenty years, just being able to be to feel safe and to trust to ask somebody for help, you know, without you know having that awkward feeling. It's like, okay, how is he going to look at me, or how is this person going to view me? Um, from my own personal experience, I've been pretty, I'm going to say lucky and very surprised that I'm just, I just tell people, well, you know, I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, I just got out of prison and I don't know how to answer that. And, and I've been fortunate that people have been very helpful, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, Shannon, I have. Uh, give me your contact. I have a list of issues that the folks faced. I worked with um, one of our board members. He's a substance abuse counselor. He, he counseled a lot of formerly incarcerated people and he gave me a list of 10 items that I can forward to you so you can look at them and, and include that in your, in your nonprofit. But here, here are some of the symptoms that these folks suffer. Hypervigilance, paranoia, mood swing, panic attack. Uh, these are the things that, and definitely advise them to see, so to see a, a therapist. There's a difference between a counselor, a therapist, I think you guys know, you know, definitely get them to see a therapist. Hopefully, you know, uh, is funded. Um, just real quick on what Venerable Dion, I mean, it's kind of funny, but, you know, you're talking about hypervigilance. I remember I've been out for, I'm going to say less than four days, five days. I'm in the bus in downtown LA and I have a brand new phone I had in my pocket. And I'm like, okay, I'm scared to pull this phone out because I don't want anybody to steal it. So I'm in the bus and I'm looking around, I'm like, what the hell? It's like, everybody's got a phone in here. You know, you like things like that. Just, just something that people out here don't even think twice about, you know, just stuff like that. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just remember what it was like with my brother having two weeks to get a job so he would start to, he would be able to pay restitution back. And I remember the look on his face when he saw you know, just my apartment, you know, being in a being in a space where he if he wanted to take a shower, he could or if he wanted to go out and walk the dog, he could. But the system isn't set up so that you can even take a bus to your job and come back before your your um your curfew uh you know closes it's 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 really tough to navigate and i give you a lot of credit or for for doing it because it's not set up to work in your favor so keep on keeping on thank you we have help <laughs> in buddhism and thank you venerable go ahead lumi with your question please Thank you, Mirush, and thank you for facilitating this platform. Um, I'd like to offer gratitude to Venerable Dihan for um, the, the facts that you presented to us. 
if you would also um, be willing to email us these as well, that would be very helpful. Um, and gratitude to Irving for being so open and vulnerable and for sharing the fruiting of your practice with us. Um, the depth of that is, is very moving. Um, I might even cry. Um, Me too. Yeah, we're both going to cry. Just bearing witness to this. Um, the cruelty of this whole system that we're living in in the world is, is heartbreaking. And uh, Ascension and I, uh, when once everyone is um, vaccinated in the prisons and outside the prisons, uh, we're going to be a part of a program called Musical Freedom at the Denver um, Women's High, High Security Correctional Facility and uh, men's, um, it's a low, low security facility where they can walk in and out. But um, I've been a music therapist and musician, a sound journeyer um, and a healer, a medicine woman, a Cherokee medicine woman um, for many years. And I've worked in hospice and I've worked in uh, orphanages in Africa and around the world with children who have been traumatized, raped, and um, have contracted AIDS. So the trauma, the trauma aspect of this is really strong. And I think music and vibration are ways of working through um, on subtle levels, different levels of trauma. And um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to be doing a um, flute, a Native American flute and drumming circles. We're going to be doing gong baths. And um, I don't know if you have any kind of insight. This is totally new territory for me. Um, I was always influenced by Johnny Cash going into the prisons and I've learned about prison systems in Nordic countries that are, are very different, where they work with horses and men who have murdered work with horses who would have otherwise been put down and they get to develop a relationship. Um, because what I do is, is very different than just psychological training. Um, and um, it, it, it goes to a deep place in people's hearts working with vibration. So I don't know if either of you have any um, advice or insight or anything to say to this. Um, if, if I may, you know, um, I, I, I went to um, the women's prison for the past four years. I worked with, and this is maximum security, three and four. And um, one thing, to, when you talk to them, look at them in their eyes, you know, don't avoid the eye contact. And don't ask, or like, don't ask them like why they are here or what ask, or don't even ask what they do. You know, like just walk with, okay, this is what we're gonna learn, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes like one thing is for me, sometimes, we, when I'm not mindful, I may say things that would be offending to them. So at the beginning, when I first visit, I said, I had to put down a disclaimer first, right? A lot of things that I might, I said, you know, uh, I, I don't intend to offend you, you know, so please keep that in mind. And, and the women, they are more sensitive to the men um, in so many aspects. So um, I, I fully res respect, uh, you know, respect them as well as the men, you know, but they are quite more sensitive to the men than, um, you know, that's one thing that I would say. Uh, Irving, you have anything to add? Um, yeah, since you mentioned about music, um, you know, that, that was one of the things, uh, I was very fortunate. I mean, just, just like I mentioned earlier, how, you know, as the prison population grew, you know, we took it upon ourselves to, you know, have self-help classes. So 
Um, I was fortunate enough where the particular prison I was in the yard, um, it was it was a what we call a programming yard. You know, everybody agreed, you know, for a random uh, drug testing, but agreed, you know, take as much programs as we can take. But one of the main things is this, you know, a lot of the guys, they started their own programs, whether it's, it's painting, uh, music, um, you know, we had inmate bands and guys would, would like, like really get excited, you know, to get through the gate and go to the music class. And one of the things that, one of the, one of the things that everybody would always say is whether if they're painting or drawing or playing an instrument, it's like, man, part of me is free. It's like for, for, for that fleeting moment, it's like, I don't feel like I'm in prison. It's like, I'm in a whole different place. So, and that helps. I mean, it, it, it's for individuals, it, it's different. What it, whatever, you know, will help them, you know, to go through their stuff. Um, whatever, what, what, what I, I suggest is, you know, this is for everyone, you know, if whatever help, whatever you think, you know, encourage, you know, encourage the guys, you know, whatever they're in prison, they're out here, said, hey, whatever is helping you, bring you some kind of peace of mind, you know, encourage that. Um, one other thing too, uh, uh, since you mentioned about the horses, uh, the particular prison I was in, or the yard, we had a, a, a dog training program and I was fortunate enough, I was there from the very beginning, I helped out, but it wasn't until maybe a year before I got released. I mean, I never thought about I was gonna get released, but you know, I became a, a you know, a dog trainer. And that that helped, that helped a lot of guys too. And I remember the very first time they brought four dogs in the yard. You can feel the difference, you know, that energy in the yard is like you can see some guys you would never hear them talk or interact with anybody. And guys would always say, man, it's like, man, I feel like a kid again or he brought me back to a time where you know, I felt normal, like I felt like a human being. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is mainly for Irving. Um, it's been kind of amazing to hear you talk because uh, um, the similarities between your and my life are amazing. Um, I did, uh, I actually committed a murder when I was 17 and um, of a person who had committed a sexual assault. And I did, um, I had life and spent 17 years in West Virginia prison. And then um, they changed the law and I got out early. So I got out uh, six years ago. Um, but like uh, the thing that you talked about, about the trauma, like to me, like um, the trauma of getting out was harder than almost any of the things in prison and before prison and all of it. It's really, it's really hard. Uh, and basically, uh, you know, I'm really grateful you shared your story and that you're trying to still help other people because I try to do that too. I I spent a few years in jobs where I kind of like they were like people trusted me, but they I kind of had to hide my past. But now I work at um, a place where we oversee recovery homes and transitional homes for the state of West Virginia. So like, I mean, I can just like walk up to people and shake my hand and be like, look, my name's Danny. I was in prison for 17 years. And that's that's kind of inspiring to me that somebody believed in me enough to give me that opportunity. But uh, just uh, I'm really grateful to you for sharing your story and to uh, Venerable for, for going into a prison because that's really hard to do. Um, I had a, a very similar, a, another thing, I was the only Buddhist guy at the prison I was at. So like, and, and honestly, completely honest, I half-assed it for years. And then like uh, 2008, I stopped half-assing it. And then I got out and started half-assing it again because of the trauma of getting out. And then five years ago, I've been out six years now, um, five years ago, uh, I really buckled down and it's been like, uh, you know, every, like the foundation upon which the rest of my life has been built. So um, anyway, thank you all both for, for this. This is fantastic. That's all I have. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing. Um, Nancy, real quick, maybe. You're muted, Nancy. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is again for Irv. 
first of all, Irv, uh, thank you so much. You're just an amazing human being. I wanted to ask, you seem so calm and so focused. Um, and I, I wanted to ask, was there anybody in your life before you went into prison who was a kind of benefactor or somebody who helped or supported you? I guess I'm asking that question because I wonder what gave you the strength to decide to start with all these self-help programs? I mean, you could have said, I'm not gonna do any of that stuff. I'm, you know, my life is wrecked. I'm in prison for life. Did somebody help you along the way or is just, or is it just something inside you that enabled you to pursue all these wholesome opportunities that weren't easy to uh, come by? Um, you know, it, it's funny that you, not funny, but you know, you asked that question because there were, there were times where I was, so I was on that edge where I'm done. Like I'm, I'm tired. I mean, there was, there was a time where I just loathed just being alive. And I got to the point where, you know what, I'm, I'm getting ready to check out, you know, it's like, I got to a point where I was just waiting for an opportunity for somebody to say something or do something stupid. And my plan was, you know, what, you know, what, how they, what they call, you know, suicide by cop was I'm going to look for an opportunity or find a reason for somebody to mess up and give me a reason to, I, mean, I don't want to be graphic, but stab the shit out of somebody. And the only way they're going to stop me was for them to shoot me. But there were times that I got to that point. And the last time I got to that point was, you know, a few years back, you know, my, my, my wife now, you know, she came into my life. And I say that, you know, she saved my life. But before that was, you know, what, what meditation, this is where meditation comes in for me, you know, having awareness. You know, there was a time that, few times that I got to that point. And then I remember one time, I remember thinking to myself, it's like, wait a minute. Okay. Yes, my life is limited in prison. If, if we want to call this life. But at the same time, it hit me like, wait a minute. My dad gave me this opportunity to live. So that was one of the things that helped me, pushed me to hold on and just live to another day was, you know, okay, in order to honor his life, to have that appreciation, it's like, okay, I'm gonna try and, and, and live as much as I can and help as many people as I can, you know? But there were times that I, I mean, even now I, I look back, it's like, okay, how the hell did I get through that? It's like, I don't, you know. Thank you so much. Wow, that's like tear jerking, isn't it? Wow. So the Dharma did find you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for all your great answers and being so vulnerable and transparent with us and trusting us. Just heart full of thanks to you and Venerable D for your continued wonderful inspiring work with engaged Buddhism Buddhist Alliance. One last thing I just want to you know thank everyone um, you know for having this opportunity to share. I, I just want to point out that just just doing this Zoom for me and there's a few of us that's been doing Zoom you know meetings and stuff and and it actually helps us to be able to to be open you know, to share it helps our healing it helps us process the stuff so i just want to say thank you to everyone wow thank, thank you. you for all your time thank you